Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell, and we are back. We said we were done, but we're going to throw in one more truly futuristic, as you can tell by my head here, futuristic aircraft that never made it to uh, production. In other words, it was never, I never really got out of the prototype stage. But first, my Jarkman assistant, I am going to pick up the visor. It's almost like, Greg, you failed me for the last time. No, that was Darth Vader. But I'm going to go ahead and toss this off camera here. There we go. Don't drop it. Oh, a nice catch by the Kenny. Now, we are talking about the McDonald, the XP67, the Moon Bat. Now, the Moon Bat was um, James McDonald's vision, and this was the first aircraft that I know of, and you can correct me if the co in the comments if I'm wrong, but the first aircraft that they... Um, that, that uh, Jim kind of tried to get built. This was early, in the early 1940s. Uh, now, you can tell on our budget we have spared <laughs> no expense for the moon bat. I guess Greg looked around, and from what I understand, this is the only moon bat we could get. So I'll give you a profile view. Greg can throw it up on the screen. Now, the moon bat uh, came out of a U.S. Army Air Force proposal called R-40C. And the idea was they wanted a high-speed interceptor. And they talked about on this interceptor everything from a 75 millimeter cannon. Now remember, we were screwing around with all these. We've talked about a lot of them in this series, heavy fighters. The idea was a heavy twin engine fighter it kind of, and it, it didn't work, by the way. We haven't seen any of them, with the exception of maybe the Mosquito is the only one I'll give you the, the benefit that was actually uh, uh, worked. Somebody could say the Bow Fighter, but they were no, none of them were ever terribly successful, especially when they ran into those kind of high end, later model uh, single engine piston fighters that just tore them up. But the Moon Bat, they messed around with everything from a 75 millimeter cannon, 20 millimeter cannons, they settled on six 37 millimeter cannons. Now think about that for a moment. Six 37 millimeter, can millimeter cannons in a bomber formation. There wouldn't be anything left of a bomber if you actually hit it with your armament. So it was very heavily armed, at least the concept. Now initially, and Greg, I'm gonna challenge you if you can find a drawing on this. The uh, moon bat was supposed to be a pusher aircraft. In other words, the props were on the backside and it was supposed to be pow powered by an Allison uh, 3420 Model 1 engine. And there was a series of gearing in there that drove that pusher power plant. They could never solve the problems and on top of that, the Allison engines turned out to be extremely valuable in wartime and they, they couldn't get them. So they re-engined the airplane and they put, turned in to more of a traditional design, a twin engine design. And these were Continental uh, 1430s. Now these were inverted V12 engines. So hold on to that for a second. The inverted V12 engines. Now the other thing about this airplane that makes it um, way, way ahead of its time, and this model makes it extremely difficult to do, but the, the way that the lifting body was shaped, the center section of the airplane, the entire aircraft used a laminar flow wing. So the, think about that for a second. The whole aircraft essentially was a laminar design on the wing, but the way that the wing was designed, the manufacturing had to be perfect. So when they went in and they started testing the wing design at NACA, first of all, they couldn't get in to do a lot of tunnel testing at NACA because what was going on? The war was going on by that time where they were getting close to war and the tunnel time was being chewed up. So they didn't get a lot of tunnel time on this, but the tunnel time that they did get talked about the fact that this wing had to be completely perfect. Um, and so they went ahead, the Army said, hey, we like this idea. 
This is the XP-67 aeroplane, designed and produced by the McDonnell Aircraft Corporation in collaboration with the United States Army Air Forces. This aeroplane is so designed that the laminar flow airfoil sections are maintained throughout. This results in a planned form of long sweeping curves as the profile is expanded and decreased to house the engines and pilot's compartment, and further results in an extremely large internal volume while maintaining the small frontal area. This volume is used to house large quantities of gasoline. The projected speed on this aircraft was 500 miles an hour, so put it in contemporary fighters of the day, if it had actually performed as advertised, it would have been one of the top apex predators, and it would have been a sensational night fighter. Think about this, and you can go back and look at the segment that we did on the, the Black Widow, on the Widow aircraft, it, the P-61. If you put this up against a P-61, this thing would fly circles around it if it flew as advertised. And I'm giving you a little caveat there because uh, there are some things that we're going to go over here. So the, uh, they re-engined it. They, we had this laminar design. When they actually decided to um, fly it, they ran into some issues. Now, what was the issues? Well, the issue was it had, the cockpit layout was good. Uh, the, the, the characteristics of the airplane were pretty good, but it did something, and I'm gonna challenge you, Greg, here. The aircraft had a tendency to Dutch roll. And so a Dutch roll would mean that the airplane would wag back and forth this way, and the wings would go like this at the same time. That's a Dutch roll. So they had problems with that, to the point that they never spin tested the airplane because they were concerned that the aircraft was unrecoverable, might be unrecoverable in a spin. Now, where have we heard that before? The Aerocobras, the Bell aircraft. Uh, basically, the idea on those airplanes was if you got into a flat spin, open the door and get out. You're, you're not gonna recover the airplane. And you can argue with me in the comments on that. But the, um, now they had dropped that Allison in favor of the Continentals, but they also ran into something else. The way that this wing was built and the way that it was designed as far as drag, the, what they could they not do? The wing was so slick that uh, what happened? Cooling. They could not deal with cooling on the airplane. And so they had nothing but cooling problems with the airplane. The aircraft, when it uh, first flew in the prototype stage, so you, you got to remember, our first flight was in January 1 of 1944. This aircraft was discontinued by September of 1944. And the reason for that was they had serious cooling problems. They also had problems with some of the bearings uh, in the engines. But the, the major problem was they just couldn't get en enough airflow in there to, um, to cool it. So not only did we have design issues, but we actually had the physical plant engineering issues that, that had to be solved. Now remember, at this point in the war, by the time we're getting to September of 1944, what's going on? The war is pretty much over, and the uh, United States could see the end of uh, piston engine fighters. So today, what I wanna do is I'm gonna put this down, and I am going to salute the folks that worked on the moon bat Probably, and I'm going to tell you a little other cool things about this when we get done with the salute, when you'll understand why I'm so impressed with this airplane. Uh, an airplane that really never was. There was one prototype. But the, the reason I'm so impressed with this is that there are, there are not a lot of time, times in um, aircraft design where you see the engineers go way beyond they're, they're, they're on the right track, but they've overreached the ability of technology. This was the issue with this airplane. I'm gonna to explain to you why, but if you were a engineer on this aircraft and you were working for McDonnell at the time, I don't know if there's any of them left, but you were a visionary because the aircraft, although it was clearly a failure, by the way, there was some sort of a fizz there, but not very much you were truly uh, way, way ahead of your time, and I'm gonna tell you why in a second. But first, 
I'm going to salute you with ginger ale uh, money bags, ginger ale. Um, thank God it is not Dr. Pimple Popper or whatever the heck that was. Um, it's hard to read here, but it does have a nutrition fact on it. So, so it is, um, it is fairly new. It did fizz. So what we're going to do today is we are going to salute the guys that worked and girls that worked on the moon bat that were way ahead of their time. I salute you. Ooh, nice ginger ale aroma. Okay, Greg, I don't know if that this is a makeup for that nasty crap that you served me last week, but this is actually good. I, I'll have another generous swig of this. Okay, so I've given you the buildup on the moon bat. Here's the payoff. Although the aircraft was unstable, what is the characteristic? I'm going to ask you at home. What is the characteristic of all modern fighters? They are inherently unstable. And the F-16 wants to pitch up. Other aircraft want to do that. The F-117 will not fly without fly-by-wire technology. I'm going to put this out there, and you can argue with me. But if the moon bat had had fly-by-wire technology where they could have smoothed out its flight control uh, issues, this thing would have been incredibly lethal. They had the engine issues, but uh, Jim McDonald had actually gone out and was looking to try to re-engine the airplane. But the reality, as I said, at that point in the war, it was too late. There was no point in doing that. Uh, it would have been interesting to see if they'd thrown jet engines on this. They actually did talk about that a little bit. For super performance, Jet propulsion units can be installed in the space now occupied by the turbo supercharger. This modification will require substitution of two-stage engines forward, which can be used for economical cruising, reserving the jet propulsion units for actual combat. But then they did one test flight, and E.E. E. Elliott was flying it, and old E.E., e., the airplane, caught fire. And E.E. E. managed to make it back but the sole prototype was destroyed in the fire. There was a second one being built. At that point, the Army Air Force said, with the problems, the teething problems they were having on this, you're done, we're, let's just scrap the program. And the program was scrapped. Now, uh, McDonnell would go on to have success. Greg, what aircraft did they build? The F-4 Phantom, among other things. They built missiles, they built some jets prior to that under uh, David S. Lewis. The interesting thing is he became chief operating officer of the company in 1962, the year I was born. We know what happened with the Phantom, but, but the Phantom went on and, and is one of the most prolific and uh, revered designs anywhere in the world. But that all started, this is the airplane it started with, this XP-67. So, although this is one of those things that, you know, I talk about moving the ball, this moved the ball on the engineering side. They learned from it, but they never really could capitalize on it because their vision, as they say, exceeded their grasp. Now, if you want to amaze your friends, you can go and walk in somewhere with this beautiful Boeing bag. And this bag, I actually have the companion to this that I travel with. This is a really, really nice like backpack and, and tote bag. I encourage you to go out and get one of these if you, if you can, if you so need one of those bags. You can go to our uh, website, click on the link, and Jason will, after he has made your bag personally, will take it down uh, to the store and mail it. Of course, Jason does not make those bags as a disclaimer. Someone will come back and say, where is his signature in the bag? I know we'll hear that. Now, we cannot do all of this. We're in the kids area here. We're them playing with uh, a lot of our, our uh, cockpits in this area. We cannot do this without your generous donation. So if you can click on that link, donate a few bucks, we would appreciate it. If you came across us on YouTube and you can get past whatever the hat is and the bizarre drink and you like long form videos. By the way, did you know 
Greg, long form videos are not really supported very much by YouTube. I didn't know that in the algorithm. They don't really support that. But if you like long form, you know, 10 to 16, 18 minute videos, uh, and you're into aviation, all we do is military aircraft. We put out one of these each week. We've got a really special series coming up for you where we actually went on a road trip. Greg and I went on a road trip. That was really interesting. Maybe I could do some behind the scenes video on traveling with Greg. It was an, an interesting experience. So uh, if you come across us on YouTube, give us a, a like and uh, give us a subscription. We can really use your subscription. If you came across us on Facebook, give us a like and a comment. We love your comments. We will respond to you. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great day. Thank mm -hmm. you.